Welcome to the ancient city of Memphis here in the Negev Desert. These days it's called Mamshit and as you can tell it's been quite a work of archaeological excavations to uncover the city gate that we're standing in right now. I wanted to show you on the map more or less where we were at and you can see here the Dead Sea, this great big blue patch here, all the way up here is the, Gal is the Sea of Galilee. But we're all the way in the south, in the Negev Desert. The biggest city in the south is Beersheba, and I hope we can go there soon. And all of this area, all the way down to the very south, which would be uh, Aqaba, ancient Aqaba, and the current city in the state of Israel named Alat, is all the way here to the south. So the Israelites would have come in all the way from the south, and Egypt wandered around the entire desert area looking for, um, well, waiting for their moment to enter into the promised land. And so here in this city, we're excited to take you into the civilization built by the Nabataeans. And in fact, this way is south. So Egypt would be that way. And then over to my right would be the city of Petra. Those were the Nabataeans like uh, we've talked about before. They've come up from Arabia. They were the great incense and spice root kings. And so they were the ones that controlled all of that trade. And they eventually built this city right here at a crossroads. To my left is the seacoast, including the most important uh, port city of Gaza. And if we go this direction, we will actually connect to the Arava. Remember that we were at, just a couple of days ago, the city of Tamar or Tamara. And that was one of the most important caravanserai because it was also on a crossroads. And so people would come from there to here. And that's why we've brought you here. And I would like to take you into this city where we find some Byzantine era churches where we will speak about the third commandment of keeping the Sabbath. Follow me. Welcome to one of the highest places here in Memphis or Mamshit. Behind us, you can see a perfect round semicircle, and that always indicates an apse in archaeology. And that means that this was a church. In fact, you can see how also the columns decorate the main area of the church, and you have some beautiful mosaics on the floor. And this is the second of the two churches here in Mamshit. And this is an important one because it's much more decorative. And when archaeologists were uncovering this, they found a medallion, in other words, a roundish um, shape right in the front that had writing in it. It has writing in it. And you can make it out, I believe it's in Greek, and it says, dedicated uh, to God by the builder Nilus. So who is this Nilus and why is this church here? Well, they call it the Church of St. Nilus because of this particular um, dedication. And they think uh, literally he may have been the builder because he was a monk in the Sinai, but he helped to build and spread Christianity all over this area. So here in Mamshit, we are talking about a place where the Nabataeans came. Once Christianity was legalized, they actually all became Christians. And so a lot of these different areas in the desert where the camels used to come and the caravanserai is what they call them to get rewatered and they would bring all of the caravans through here, uh, charge taxes and they became very wealthy, the Nabataeans did. Um, they were great businessmen. But these were also the ancient routes where the patriarchs uh, walked, where the people of Israel very well could have come through here. But as a Christian city, what can it tell us about the third commandment? Well, let's read it first of all. What does it say? If you look at Exodus 20 or even Deuteronomy 15, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall be your labor and to do all your work. But the Sabbath day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. And so in this beautiful church on this mountaintop, I thought it was a perfect time to talk about a Sabbath for the Lord. And it says actually in Mark 2, I think it's important to connect this since we are in a Christian town. Uh, it says, this is Jesus, the Sabbath was, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So it's very interesting. In the Old Testament, it says, a Sabbath of the Lord. And then Jesus clarifies it saying that the Sabbath was made for man, 
not man for the Sabbath. So let's dive into this. What is it that we can glean from this and how should we live the third commandment? First of all, what does the word Sabbath mean? Well, in Hebrew, Shavvat or Shavat, Shavat, the V and the V and in those in the language is the same letter in Hebrew. And that is the word which means to rest. So we know very well in the Holy Land here, the Jewish people celebrate the Shabbat, the Sabbath, the seventh day. And so it's the last day of the week and they rest. And this is a biblical tradition which commemorates the original seventh day. I think we all know this. When the Lord made all of creation, uh, he rested on the seventh day. And I've always made the reflection, just like it happens to me when I see a beautiful mosaic floor like this. When he saw how beautiful creation was, he was filled with such joy. He wanted time in a certain way, even though he's beyond time, to take it in and to sit with it, to, to rest with it. And the very last beautiful thing he made in creation were man and woman in that order. And so he wanted to rest with that and see the, just the wonderfulness of this creature that he made in all of creation. So this is what it means in a way uh, to rest, to rest. And so a Sabbath, it says in the Old Testament, a Sabbath to the Lord your God. So a rest to the Lord your God. And I think it's a wonderful time to reflect then when we're t talking about uh, the commandments and staying in covenant with the Lord. Um, what does it mean to rest in God? How can I rest in the Lord? Well, I think it's honestly a foreshadowing of the rest that he will provide for all of us, for all of his children forever and ever. And it's not just this boring playing a harp on a cloud type of rest or just, you know, that long awaited catching up on my sleep. It's actually resting in the fullness of beauty, in wonder, in, in grace and in joy. I think that's what the Lord God was doing on the seventh day of creation. So what we just read was, it's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is holy to the Lord. Again, like we said, it's the seventh day of creation. But also because the seventh day isn't just that, it's also a memorial of the Israelites' liberation from slavery in Egypt. And that's actually what it says in Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. So let me read it uh, for us right now. It says, You shall remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So he's bringing those two things together. The Sabbath is a sign of their freedom. The Sabbath is a sign of their deliverance. Keeping the Lord's day holy reminds us that we are delivered and we are free, that he has made us free. And so it brings us to the covenant with the Lord. And we have to remember that when we come into a beautiful place like this and gather together in worship, we're remembering that the covenant is irrevocable. The Lord keeps his promises always. And you know, there's a lot of trust issues in the world today. We can think about people, I can think about people right now that it's hard for me to trust for a lot of reasons, maybe human reasons, maybe other reasons uh, because of things that have happened in the past or just their character, the way that they are. You're never really sure what's going to happen. But with the Lord, he is fully trustworthy. And so we can put our confidence in him. And that's actually part of why the Sabbath is so important, living this holy day. So what does it say in Exodus 31, verse 16? It says, The sons of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the sons of Israel. It's a covenant. It's a sign. When you're in love with someone or in a relationship, little signs, little gestures are key to keeping love fresh and to keeping love alive. Coming and keeping the Lord's day holy is the way that the Lord also sees that we want to keep this love fresh. But even more so, he gives us the grace to keep this, this covenant fresh. It's a sign of his great love for us, of his great forgiveness and his immense grace. In other words, of the covenant. And it says also, of course, that we just read, throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. When you discover things like this in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert, and you think, oh my gosh, in these beautiful churches, 
thousands upon thousands of Christians worshipped, not only the people who lived here in Mamshid, but also the pilgrims that would come from the north and make their way down to Sinai. This was a pilgrim route. And so they came here in all of these different places in the desert that we'll see to uh, be refreshed. And actually their main goal in these cities was not just to recover their strength to continue the journey. It was to celebrate the liturgy together. It was to celebrate the Eucharist together to renew that covenant. And so it's fascinating. It really makes us holy or it really makes the day holy. <laughs> and it's set aside for the praise of God. So it's really neat that Exodus says that God rested and was refreshed. And so when we worship the Lord and remember his steadfast love for us, his steadfast fidelity and trustfulness in the covenant, we will also be rested and refreshed. We know how in every culture all around the world, everyone looks for time for vacation or they want, they long for a time of the weekend or vacation. And so it's looked for. And it's interesting that even the poorest don't have to work if you keep the Sabbath holy. Even those that are just bound by, you know, every little cent that they can make, they also in their dignity deserve a time for rest. They need to be rested and refreshed. And so what is it that the Sabbath, keeping holy the Sabbath, tells us? Stop. Work is halted. And this provides respite in itself. And if we're talking about a pilgrimage of freedom, keeping holy the Sabbath is a protest against slavery. A protest against the slavery of work a protest against the slavery and being bound by results and just all of the things that the, the corporate world asks us, just constant, constant. That's not who we are. That's not what we're living for. That's not what gives us dignity. We all have to work, but we protest being slaves to it. And so we can cry out when we keep holy the Sabbath, let my people go. When Christians live this, they say, let my people go. We are not slaves. We are not slaves to money. We're not servitude being servants to work. And we need to be freed from that, the worship of this production. We're made for so much more. And so that's also why I think that Christ declares in what we read at the beginning, you know, man, uh, the Sabbath was made for man. It's not a legalistic thing. Like sometimes happens where we live in Tiberias, you know, the elevators don't work in certain places because in the Sabbath you can't work and so you can't make a fire and because you can't make a fire you can't take the, take the elevator in case a spark you know you get a short circuit and a spark is ignited so suddenly you have a fire and you're not following the law you're not resting that's not the deep meaning of what it means to keep the sabbath it's rather as jesus says in mark 3 it's that of doing good rather than harm saving a life rather than killing it so the sabbath is a day for the lord of mercies his great desire is for man to be fully alive. And that's the reason for the Lord's Day. Up the path from the church we were just at, St. Milos, you come to another much larger church called the Church of the Martyrs in the same small town of Mamshid here in the desert. And I've taken my place here next to the baptistry. All of the towns, the Nabataean towns of this time when they became Christian, have baptistries in the shape of a cross. A little place here where you actually wash your feet before you descend into the death of the Lord and come out a new Christian on the other side, a new person, a child of God. And you can make out the beautiful wadi behind us that protects the city of Mamshit. And so you can say with the psalmist in Psalm 118, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. That is definitely the psalm for the Lord's day, for keeping holy the Sabbath. So let's read what St. Justin Martyr speaks about in this Church of the Martyrs when he's discussing this commandment of how Christians keep holy the Sabbath. This is what he says. And remember, he lived about the year, I'm trying to think, I think he was, um, he died about the year 100, if I'm not mistaken. So this was a very early uh, writer. And he says this, 
We all gather on the day of the sun, for it is the first day after the Jewish Sabbath, but also the first day when God separating matter from darkness made the world. And this is the same day Jesus, our Savior, rose from the dead. So in that sense, this is why we're here. Because Christians keep holy the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sunday fulfills the spiritual truths of the Jewish Sabbath. And it announces, secondly, to mankind, the eternal rest in God. But this only happens for Christians because of Jesus' past. In other words, his death and his resurrection, just like what happens with us in baptism. It is the first day of a week, the Sunday, the day of the sun, as he says. Now, also, St. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, he actually says the following about the Christian holy day. He says, those who live according to the old order of things have come into a new hope, no longer keeping the Sabbath, but the Lord's day in which our life is blessed by him and by his death. So in these two ways, we can see this whole Christian understanding of coming together and keeping this commandment, this real commandment that Jesus himself said is fulfilled and never, not even one iota of the law taken away. We do fulfill it on Sunday. And this is what happened up here in this beautiful church. So this third commandment, when we come together, we're actually giving witness, giving testimony, And that's why it's so adequate to be up here on the Church of the Martyrs, because martyrdom is the most high testimony, the greatest witness and testimony of God's uh, fidelity and love for him. So we're giving testimony through an outward, visible, public, and regular and constant, in that sense, worship. That's what it means to come together as Christians. So Sunday worship fulfills this commandment, the third commandment, and takes up the same rhythm and spirit of the Jewish Sabbath but it is fulfilled in Christ. So as I was saying, Jesus' Passover, his death and his resurrection is celebrated at every Eucharist. This is what was celebrated on this beautiful mountaintop. And so um, as the letter to the Hebrews says, in fact, uh, I think just before Lent started, we were all reading the letter to the Hebrews if you went to daily mass. It's a really rich text and talks a lot about the liturgical life, just like what people would live here when they're keeping the Sabbath. And this is what it says. It says not to neglect Not to neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, but to encourage one another. So living the Sabbath isn't just for me. It's for everyone. We need that encouragement and we must help one another. And in Acts 2 and in 1 Corinthians, uh, St. Paul actually testifies to the fact that Christians come together and worship. So this is an ancient practice just like we see here in the city. So this church, this space like parishes, like your parish, like my church back at home, like the church we have in Magdala, allows Christians to come together and celebrate and give testimony. And I wanted to read from St. John Chrysostom. Uh, He lived in the 300s, and he also speaks about this. He says very clearly, you cannot pray at home as at church, where there is a great multitude of people where exclamations are cried out to God as from one great heart and where there is something more, a union of minds, the accord of souls, the bond of charity, the prayers of the priests. So you're actually multiplying, we're actually multiplying our worship. Our little tiny prayers just become amplified and go up to the Lord when we are together on the Lord's day. And so this is also why the church reiterates this law of God. Come together, together as his sons and daughters. Let us honor him and worship him and praise him. And as we said just a little bit ago, enter into that rest and be rested. And this is what it means to keep holy the Sabbath. Um, The foundation of Christian practice, the celebration of God and the testimony of belonging um, to him, And the testimony of being in communion, of being faithful to Christ is essential, is essential so that we can also give witness to the holiness of God. I mean, why do we do this anyway? It actually is striking when you live in the Holy Land and you see everything shut on the Sabbath. It's actually on their Saturday. It's really irritating. But every single Christian pilgrim that comes through here says, oh, if we would only live the Sundays like this. 
because it brings everybody's mind to God and it says what testimony they give. Going to church, fulfilling the Lord's day gives testimony. And again, as St. Paul says, it strengthens us in the spirit. So as we come to the end of this particular visit here, as we've taken you to the desert, I would like you to take out your notebook, your little personal Decalogue, your Ten Commandments. And on this first tablet, where we're still talking about honoring the Lord, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, I would like you to write a few things, or invite you to write a few things. First of all, identify what work on Sunday hinders you from worshiping the Lord, from worshiping Him who deserves it, who, who you know, He's God. We owe Him worship. What work am I doing that hinders me from that? You might want to ask yourself a second question. What work hinders you from the joy that is appropriate in living the Lord's day? Is it a day of joy? And if not, why? Thirdly, looking back to Christian tradition, what hinders you from the works of mercy? Remember, the Lord's day is a day where... um, it was common to help the poor um, to do, actually, I'll remind us all of the works of mercy. They are to feed the hungry, to give a uh, drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter those who are traveling, visit the sick or the imprisoned, to bury the dead, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to admonish sinners, to bear patiently with those uh, who do us wrong. Those are all the works of mercy. And this is the day of the God of mercy. And this is when Christians are to live as Christians, these acts of mercy. So what's hindering me from doing that on the Lord's day? At another level, at a human and a spiritual level, what is hindering me from rest and relaxation of my mind and my body on the Lord's day? Fifthly, Just take account and see if I am conscious, aware of my brothers who also have the right to rest and worship. And this would be especially if I'm the boss of somebody, if I'm in charge of someone and we're asking them to work. Because again, Sundays traditionally were consecrated by Christians to do the works of mercy. And finally, just a last reflection that we can make during this day of Lent as we reflect on this commandment. What hinders me from times of silence and reflection for growth in Christian interior life? Because if it's the holy day of the Lord, it's so that I can also rest in the spirit and rest in growing in that interior life and union with the Lord. That implies reflection and silence. And whenever I come out to the desert, this desert or the desert of Judea, I love the silence. It's a place of silence. And that's why so many people came out here to find the Lord. So do I look for that? Do I have that space, that time, and that silence for him? So again, from here, from lovely Mom Sheep, right at the edge of this gorgeous wadi, know that we're praying for you. Our whole team has you in our prayers during this Lent. And we will continue to pray for you as pilgrims. We should pray for one another on this journey of freedom, on this pilgrimage of freedom. So God bless you all, and we hope, I hope, you can join us again tomorrow as we continue into another wonderful town here on this desert journey, this incense route, this spice route, as we continue reflecting on the third commandment. God bless you.